one of the things you, you mentioned in this book about uh, inequality, you know, notice uh, has been widely uh, happening around the world. I mean, as globalization deepens, uh, we, we see the inequality. Uh, for example, we, we notice that, you know, for example, the, the, the one percent of the U.S. Uh, 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 most uh, <laughs> elite or, 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 or people in the, in the, in the top, top bracket, uh, that their wealth is almost equal to 42, 40, 5% of the mass population. And, and that actually, in many developed countries have the same trend on that. And whereas also the, uh, the company is, is going global, but then they are not probably benefiting exactly uh, the home country or the host country of that. For example, NAFTA was blamed for hovering out the Midwest and <laughs> not benefiting uh, US on. I, I was talking to uh, you know, Martin Wolf. He was saying uh, capitalism is global, but democracy is local. So if the, if the population locally is not happy, then they actually, politician needs to find a, a, a scapegoat for that, and, and China easily to become a, a scapegoat very often. So, so what do you think about this inequality issue, and uh, where, where the gap is getting wider and wider in the last uh, several decades, and also even during the pandemic, I mean, we see the 1% the is getting even wealthier. Uh, uh, stock market is uh, all-time high now. So, uh, how we explain that? Explain that, and uh, and uh, what, what are the true challenges for for our contemporary world? Yeah, so I think you have to be careful here to separate different kinds of inequality, right? So there's inequality in income, which is what perhaps we first think about, and the top one percent is mostly about inequality in income, and then what you were talking about at the end there, which I think is becoming increasingly important. And some politicians in the United States, like Elizabeth Warren, for instance, be focusing much more on wealth inequality than on income inequality. And as you say, there's been this enormous explosion of wealth inequality during the pandemic, much more so in the United States than in Europe, for example, because the US stock market has gone up so much. And largely because the big tech companies are here in the US and it's their enormous success during the pandemic um, which has driven up those stock market um, values. But there's also the inequality we write about in our book, which is the inequality of respect, and of, which in the US seems to come with education. And to us, that's the deepest problem because the people, these um, people without a VA, you know, have been sort of left behind. They're not politically represented. And what you say is exactly right. Our colleague Bob Cahane used to say that the major force today in international relations is what is happening within countries. That's exactly like what Martin Wolf said about democracy is local and globalization is global. Well, the threats to globalization today are coming from within countries, not from between countries. And we think it's this, um, if you like, disrespect of the separation or leaving these people behind who favor populist solutions that are the real threat to globalization. I mean, you know, if you get another decade of, of Mr. Trump, um, then it's not clear how much will be left of globalization at the end of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to go back to what you said about NAFTA, um, speaking to some of the economists who were in the Clinton administration when NAFTA was passed, they knew that jobs would be lost in the US. But the, what they thought was that, well, this is a good time for the US to upskill. And so that those jobs would be lost, but those workers would be better skilled, they would retrain them, and then that would lift, the, lift everyone. But what happened was NAFTA passed, the jobs were lost, but the upskilling never took place. So those people were sort of thrown out into the wilderness to fend for themselves. And that's going to foment um, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of anger over a period of time when people feel like they're not participating. They're not, when the rest of what they see as being you know, a, a wealth increasing among some groups and they're not getting any part of that increase in the size of the pie. So, uh, and that's a failure also of democracy in the US.
Yeah, I think U.S. is still very strong in those, uh, you know, uh, among the 100 top universities, U.S. has half of that and uh, attract talents around the world, you know, make a very innovative uh, country. I think that probably is the core uh, strength that U.S. has. And I think China is also learning that. Of course, uh, China is, uh, has over 3,000 universities of uh, currently on campus, 35 million uh, students on campus. So I think that uh, education probably uh, is really uh, according to your, your study, is really one of the key factors that China is doing, paying a lot of attention to that. Uh, perhaps I would like to have David to, to comment on that as well. You've been living in China since 2016. I mean, and also you've been contact, uh, you've been, you know, you study a lot of, uh, of, the, of the wages of development and, uh, you know, all those uh, 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 labor economics and, uh, and uh, financing. And so maybe what's your take on that on the, compared with the country you, you come from, U.S., and also the country you already lived in for the last uh, six, six, seven years already, yeah. Well, I'll speculate about it for a minute. Uh, there's, there's one term that I hear in Chinese that's a term that they use for taxi drivers or for anybody that operates equipment or any sort of skilled uh, job, and it's shifu. And it, it basically is the way people show respect to a, a manual work. And a lot of these people are much poorer than typical people at equivalent jobs in the U.S. But I don't think they feel the pressure and the despair. Although, you know, so, some, of the, some of the delivery guys, they're usually young guys from the countryside, they work extremely hard, very long days. And they may be, be under a lot of pressure from their employers to, to do things rapidly. But even people working in the parks and stuff, I, I don't feel like they think they're looked down upon. Where I, I think American working class people now think they're just flat out looked down upon. And that, uh, naturally that stokes anger and uh, sort of a feeling of hopelessness. Uh, do you think that's a right interpretation of what's, what's going on? Uh, I, yes, absolutely. Um, and, and that, that's also something that separates the U.S. from, say, Europe, right? So if you go and travel in Europe, there's a, there's a lot of respect paid for people who do manual work um, that we don't see in the U.S. But so, it's also true that um, some of it's common with, with Britain, too. So one thing that many people have written about, and I think it's very important, is you know, people who used to work for Bethlehem Steel in Baltimore, for instance, mm. there's a new book called Fulfillment about Amphison. You know, where my grandfather died in a mine, in a mining accident in Yorkshire, where, in the village where my father grew up, that mine is no longer there. The unions are no longer there. The mm. solid rock hard um, labor people who used to vote for the Labour Party are not there. They're voting conservative, and there's an Amazon warehouse on the site where the mine was. Mm -hmm. All right. Now those jobs, many people have written how badly, how hard it is to work in an Amazon warehouse or so-called fulfillment center. But they're not dangerous like working in the mine, and they're not dangerous like working in the steel work it was, and they're relatively well paid. I mean, Amazon is paying something like $15 an hour in the U.S. But there is a sort of sense of despair that this is meaningless work that's working on a clock. And, you know, these are more, anthrop um, what's the word? Um, anyway, they're, they're more sociological accounts or individual accounts of people who've lived these lives and written by them. And there's a feeling that the meaning of life, you know, is not what it was in those towns, and there's been a lot of loss of society. I mean, in New Yorkshire mining towns, there were these famous brass bands, and you know, there were famous um, soccer clubs, and you know, there was a social life built around those jobs, dangerous and dirty though they were. And there's no similar social life built around an Amazon warehouse. So I think that is happening pretty much, you know, throughout. Actually, as, as Professor Deaton and Professor Case just said, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the American have this phenomenon that uh, uh, people, you know, if there's high school, they're not pursuing university and they maybe may they don't have a, a very bright future. And, and same mentality actually is, uh, is happening in China as well. Mm -hmm. And, 
and also people didn't even bother to go to the uh, you know vocational school or, or or other specialized college because everybody wants to go to university. So that is not really a, a healthy thing. Uh, but, but, but on the other hand, Chinese, Chinese people do work very hard. I mean, uh, you, you, there's talk about uh, 724 or, or 966, you know, nine hours, day six, there's a week or something. I also want to get the, uh, 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 two uh, uh, distinguished scholars' advice is that, uh, uh, you know, when, when, when the, uh, this kind of a, a culture issue, how does that play in, a, in, a, in a inequality or the country development? Or the, or, the, or, the, or the prosperity. For example, I was uh, invited to, uh, to bid farewell for the uh, uh, former uh, US ambassador in China. And, uh, and, uh, and he said, actually, uh, his impression on China is that, OK, uh, the China is people are working very hard, diligent people. They have uh, attached great importance on education. And also, they have a great, uh, you know, uh, have the, uh, stick to the family values as well. Uh, you know, there's a tremendous family value. According to the population consensus, uh, you know, 10 years ago, there was about four person in the family, now it's about three something. <laughs> so China is, uh, is also changing on that as well. So, so what, I'm, what I'm asking is that with, with the, the culture, uh, you know, China has a 5,000 years history, it was always, uh, uh, you know, the, that uh, pe trying to be neutral and uh, uh, inclusive, and, and would that play something in the country development as well? Oh, inequality issue as well. China actually, there's a saying in China, you know, they don't, they don't mind that uh, there's not enough, but they don't mind, they, are, they mind very much if not redistribute fairly. So, so we have this redistributing upward, in using your term, <laughs> not downward, not, not trickling down. Uh, the wealth of, of, of Western country, for example. So China is trying to avoid that. You know, for example, decades of lifting uh, 800 million people out of poverty, you know, uh, 10 years ahead of uh, SDG 2030 agenda of UN, number one priority that uh, cutting 70% of uh, uh, global po poverty uh, uh, just by China alone. So, so what do you think about this culture and, and those hi historical factors and, and cultural factors? Well, the, you may, I believe in these cultural factors. You know, I, I grew up in Scotland. In Scotland, you would hear many of the same things you just said about China. You know, we give enormous respect um, for education, um, very, very strong um, family values. Actually, yesterday, or maybe the day before, I was talking to a group in the British Parliament, and one of the lords there, who was a Scotsman, had said, you know, that what worried them most about Scotland today was these family values that were so strong in his day um, seemed to be weakening um, there. But, you know, just come back to my half joking comment about Marxism, <laughs> you know, culture changes with the conditions of production. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, those Scottish families were thriving within the system where there were jobs. Um, and, you know, we, we have a friend, uh, actually a brother-in-law, who said that when he decided to go to college in when the 70s? 1972. 1972. His friends in New York, a relatively poor area of New York, his parents were Italian immigrants, um, and said, why are you going to college? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Um, you know, you're going to use your diploma to pay the bills and so on. Now, in Scotland, that wasn't the case. People really wanted to go to college. So, but these things change. And in these times in America where there were good jobs, where there were factories and so on. So every country has to, is facing this change. And, you know, the, the change um, is always going to be difficult to handle. And it seems to be particularly badly handled in the United States. Um, I think China has done very well. I mean, you um, embraced a form of um, markets, a form of capitalism which has generated enormous amount of wealth and relieved a lot of poverty. But there are really dangers there too because capitalism can get out of hand. And David had said, you know, Chinese markets are very competitive. You gotta keep them that way because there are real dangers of people who get very rich undermining a competitive system. And a lot of that seems to happen in the US. <laughs>